Good afternoon. Welcome to the Future of Democracy. Uh, I'm your host, Sam Gill. Uh, earlier this summer, uh, we had on the show Vanita Gupta, the CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, one of the historic leading civil rights organizations in this country, and she helped us to unpack uh, the moment of real reckoning that was happening in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Um, Vanita was preceded in that role at the Leadership Conference by an iconic leader, Wade Henderson. Few have been as central to the cause of civil rights in this country over recent decades as Henderson. And over that time, virtually every major piece of civil rights legislation enacted bears his fingerprints. During this turbulent and important moment, there seemed like no better guide to help us navigate the present and the future of the arc of justice in this country. We're going to go a little long today, and even that won't do uh, the experiences of Mr. Henderson justice. Um, so please do remember, if you have to drop off, that this whole episode will be available on demand and as a podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. I want to get right into it. And so without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the show, Wade Henderson. Wade, good to have hey, you with Sam. us. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to join you today. No, thank you. Thanks for coming on. I I know we'll want to talk a lot about what's happening today um, mm. in our country, um, given a year that, you know, for many, I'm sure will be defining um, for their experience of the country. But before we do that, um, tell just tell us a little bit about your life. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I look forward to talking about today, but I think there is great value in talking about the continuum of social change that's occurred in this country since the start of the 20, 20th century. And yeah, I, I'm a native Washingtonian, um, Sam. I, I was born in the nation's capital, and um, I was born at a time uh, when Washington was still a racially segregated city by law. So um, I experienced from an early age the sort of contradiction of American democracy. On the one hand, we were the beacon of the world's greatest democracy, nation's capital. On the other hand, we were a uniquely Southern city with a form of racial apartheid that was incredibly dehumanizing. Um, you know, I started school the year that Brown versus the Board of Education uh, became the law of the land. And uh, while I don't remember that uh, period, I do remember the general conversations of my parents and, and neighbors sort of talking about the change that was taking place and, and what sort of Brown symbolized. I didn't understand it was Brown per se, but I understood that change was taking place. And yet, you know, DC for the entire time of my public education experience remained a racially segregated city, even after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it did have a dehumanizing uh, effect that helped to shape uh, my worldview and helped to propel me to where I am today. What was, did you have a, a sort of a moment of awakening when you felt that this, that your career was going to be to address this injustice? Was it a process of awakening? What was important to you in, in, in the, in the yeah, arc That's of a good question, it? Sam. I mean, I, you know, we all have had, and by we all, I'm referring now in this instance to African Americans who were born into a racially segregated world. We've all experienced a level of injustice that invariably propels us to what we do. I'm almost embarrassed to talk about my experiences because they were tepid in comparison to people like John Lewis or others who, you know, spilled blood, C.T. Vivian, for the kind of horrors that, um, you know, we experienced in this country. And yet it, it was the dehumanizing effect of racial segregation that one, you know, from my perspective, really, um, you know, was the, the irritant that I could never ultimately resolve. And I felt it in a profound way. Uh, I think a, a moment of awakening for me was at the 63 uh, March on Washington. And I sort of defied my parents and went, I was 15. It was, uh, yeah, yeah, they were uh, from, you know, in DC, fearful that it was gonna become a violent experience right. that had been the talk of the press. And yet I felt it was important for me to go. And I went and the experience was and illuminating. It was just an incredible moment. The atmosphere, seeing the men and women dignified 
there approaching the government for their vested rights as American citizens had a real impact on me. I don't remember the speeches per se, but I remember seeing John Lewis. I remember seeing Dr. King uh, in the, and, and you know, being there was just an incredible moment for me. So that obviously had a real impact. Uh, I was a, a student at Howard University um, in the, the late 1960s and that experience also helped shape me. It was incredibly profound, but being there on the day that Dr. King was murdered and feeling the effect of his loss and knowing what that meant for the country and then watching the eruption of violence both in Washington and around the country had a real impact on me and a sense that, look, you have got to do something that ultimately, uh, in terms of your career, your life, will help to address these issues. These injustices were, you know, they, they chafed on me and I couldn't really uh, live with them comfortably. What was really a catalyst for me though, is that I attended, Sam, a protest at the Supreme Court, 1969, in a case involving Adam Clayton Powell, who was an African-American member of Congress, the most powerful congressman of his generation. He was from Harlem, but he was chair of the Education and Labor Committee in the House at a time when being a committee chair gave you great power and influence. He had been wrongly expelled uh, from Congress. And so his case went to the Supreme Court as Powell versus McCormick. Powell was Adam Clayton Powell. McCormick was John McCormick, the Speaker of the House. And a case was brought. And on the day of the oral argument, uh, I was there in front of the uh, Supreme Court protesting. One, because we loved Adam Clayton Powell. We saw him as a spokesperson for, um, you know, a very progressive uh, view of African-American equality and liberation. And he was also internationally uh, connected and spoke to uh, the emerging uh, former colonial powers. And that was really important to me. But uh, he also um, was being defended by a professor at Howard Law School, Herbert O. Reed. And we had gone to the uh, oral argument to su show support for our a law school professor. I was still an undergrad at the time. But there I met a, a, Congress, a, a, a lawyer who really was the number one uh, attorney for Adam Clayton Powell. His name was Arthur Canoy. He was a professor at Rutgers Law School. And uh, I heard him speak and he was such an incredibly powerful orator. And he talked about injustice in such a fundamental way. And he lifted up in his conversations always the importance of the 13th Amendment, as well as the 14th and 15th Amendment of the Constitution, those Civil War amendments and what it meant for American democracy. And I was really floored by him. And I ended up changing my decision. I was going to be a sociologist and was graduating from Howard and, and uh, a year later. Uh, but I ended up uh, deciding to go to law school and I went to Rutgers. And uh, it was an incredible experience. Uh, I was there at a time when the law school itself was going through uh, a response to the urban uh, challenges of Newark in 1967. They had established a diversity program called the Minority Student Program. And it was a law school that had made a fundamental commitment to uh, achieving a level of diversity in the bar because of the importance of lawyers in achieving social change. And it was an incredible time to be there. Elizabeth Warren started school there the year I graduated, but uh, you know, I ended up working at Rutgers as well. And so I got to see just how wonderful the law could be as a tool for social change. And that really helped to set me on the path that I'm pursuing now. So I wanna, I wanna come back to, I wanna pick up the story there, but for, you mentioned John Lewis and having the chance as a, you, you know, you were a young man, he was a young man uh, mm -hmm. to see him. And, you know, it strikes me in the, in the weeks that we've been um, commemorating his life and his achievements, um, you know, what a lot of our reflection as a nation has been around kind of John Lewis, the finished product, you know, the, the senior statesman what was it? What was it like to be? To, what was he like as a young man? What What was What was it like to see him um, as as someone who was on, who was giving blood? You know, as you mentioned, who was yeah, really on yeah, the front lines of yeah, an active fight. Yeah. John Lewis was a radical. John Lewis was one of the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. 
uh, which was one of the great student-led advocacy organizations of, of the 1960s. John Lewis was at the cutting edge of the major social change initiatives uh, of the early 1960s and beyond. It was not an accident that Lewis uh, spoke at the 1963 March on Washington and was the youngest speaker present. He had earned that spot by symbolizing the power of young people to transform the nation. You know, it's, it's, it's young people who have brought this incredible combination of energy and courage and intolerance for, you know, injustice. You know, young people are the ones who believe so much in the fundamental ideals, even if they show a certain cynicism on the outside. Uh, their actions sort of belie that and seem to suggest mm. a deep commitment to fundamental American values. And Lewis symbolized that uh, as much as anyone, more than most. And so um, knowing that uh, John Lewis uh, led the effort uh, to uh, you know, really bring uh, young people to the fore is, is really incredibly um, meaningful for me. Now, you know, we talked about uh, his influences at the time. And obviously, women like Fannie Lou Hamer, sure. who, uh, Ella Baker, I mean, you know, women as well as men, and who brought uh, this courage and uh, incredible uh, capacity for truth uh, to the fore is what made John Lewis so, so, so profoundly important. Now, obviously, when he came to Congress, he evolved and became a congressman, a, 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 and he used his, his, his history of involvement in social change, as well as his willingness to engage his colleagues across the aisle, uh, is what made him so special. So, you know, it's now become fashionable to talk about a commitment to good trouble. But right. before that became, uh, you know, a catchphrase, uh, Lewis exhibited that in the work he did almost every day. And so his, his absence his passing uh, is a real loss to the nation, but it also symbolizes the kind of generational change that is inevitable. Uh, and uh, we are both, you know, memorializing his passing, but also celebrating the voices of new leaders who are emerging today. I, you know, I want to stay on this digression for just a minute more, yeah. just because I think it has so much to do with sort of what the future of social justice could look like. I mean, I, I find myself sort of torn between optimism and pessimism about generational change. Like on the one hand, you know, you, there, the, the, the new icons necessarily emerge, the sort of Greta Thunbergs. Um, on the other hand, you know, a lot of young people seem to have more of a burn it all down. Um, it can't work for me attitude rather than I sort of interpret good trouble as, hey, we've got to, we've got to create some crisis so that it will work for us. The system yes. will work for us. And then the general election candidates, you know, are going to are, are on the older side, the Senate average age is on the older side. Like, when you yeah. look at the world today, where do you, are you optimistic or concerned about the kind of generational change that will bring about? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Look, you know, um, I'm a civil rights advocate, right? So I so by definition, I come to the table <laughs> with a, a certain level of optimism, because it would be impossible to do what we do if we didn't have an optimistic worldview about what we could accomplish. And I think I, I compare that to the people who came before, the men and women on whose shoulders we stand. And I can't help but be humbled, recognizing that they put up with so much more at such a higher level of risk uh, than we face that I can't afford to the indulgence of, of being somewhat pessimistic. Now, having said that, uh, secondly, I, I believe that young people are uh, really the, the source of most change in social movements. I mean, that's, I think, historically pretty accurate, not to say that they have always led the movements, sure. but they have been a part of the energy that has helped propel the movement forward. That was certainly true of, of that phase of the civil rights movement that John Lewis is most closely associated with, and I think it's true today. So I am uh, very pleased, actually, that we are seeing the emergence of new leaders who are bringing perspectives different than those that we brought to the table, and uh, they are expanding our capacity for change. Uh, just one quick digression or example, 
uh, you know, Vanita Gupta. Uh, yeah. You introduced me by saying that uh, Vanita Gupta, the current president of the leadership conference, um, uh, you know, stands on the shoulders of men and women who came before. I got that. But Vanita, in her own right, is a source of great change and advocacy skill. And she is a generation uh, behind me. And I was extremely pleased to be able to open the door and to hand off uh, this leadership role to someone who I believed had prepared all of her life for what she's doing now. And I think looking at where the leadership conference stands on this continuum of activism uh, convinces me that that's correct. So at the end of the day, Sam, um, no, I'm, I'm not uh, pessimistic. I, I do think that, uh, you know, what we are doing today builds on what came before. I believe that. And I think knowing a bit of our own history is an important element in preparing oneself for leadership, both now and in the future. But at the same time, I'm prepared uh, to accept the leadership of, uh, you know, those who are generation ahead of me uh, or behind me, because look, they have to uh, test the waters on their own. And they bring us an assortment of new tactics to the table, some that will be successful, some that won't. But they have to be given the opportunity to lead just as uh, we were. And, you know, it, uh, it's not always easy to um, engage in that transition. But I think if you're committed to leadership in the future, and I think more and more of my colleagues who were in positions of responsibility are, you see that in the way they've transitioned leadership within their own organizations. How do you, one of the questions we got in the chat, just to sort of close this digression out, is how to how to motivate the emerging generation to participate in in activism, whether that's sort of formal political participation through voting or or getting out. I, I think we're it's, it strikes me we're seeing different ways of motivation that are more or less effective. What what do you, what do you think is the key to getting this emerging generation yeah, to engage? Yeah, you know, um, I wish I had a clear answer. I mean, I, I believe in the power of voting. I mean, I, I believe that voting is the language of democracy. And if you don't vote, you don't count. I believe that. And I believe that the voter suppression efforts are directly proportionate to what's at stake. You see these efforts to deny uh, voting, particularly from communities that are most directly affected by the policies enacted by people in leadership who are encouraged not to vote, and sometimes they, you know, fall prey uh, to those arguments. So I think our big uh, job is to convince uh, people that voting and the system of, of voting is an important element, not the sole element, but an important element in pursuing change. So I think that's number one. But I also think we have to um, allow, uh, again, those in, in, in the leadership of these communities to begin helping to inform us. We have to listen about what they think is necessary to bring about change and to engage people in uh, the debates that uh, you know, are affecting their lives. And we've got to figure that out. Now, I think there are certain issues that lend themselves uh, to that kind of involvement. I think George Floyd's murder uh, coming on uh, the heels of Breonna Taylor's uh, shooting and uh, Ahmed Arbery's uh, murder. I mean, th those things brought, again, into sharp relief, the level of injustice in our own criminal uh, justice system. And I think trying to seek and pursue reform in that area, where people feel directly affected by the existing policy, is one way to get folk involved. And you see that in the incredible um, uh, responses, the demonstrations which have taken place around the country. Talk about in, an encouraged feeling, Sam. I was you know, very uh, surprised in the most uh, wonderful way to see the level of community engagement around George Floyd's murder. Uh, the diversity of the um, participants in these demonstrations. Uh, both uh, in terms of race and ethnicity, but also in terms of generational diversity. Yeah. Uh, and that to me singles, you know, sort of signals a willingness to engage that was not always there. And I think that has been one of the uh, symbols of the impact of this movement. Secondly, you know, we've had over 4,000 demonstrations around the globe 
uh, since George, George Floyd was murdered. And that is also a symbol that the fundamental injustice that Black Lives Matter uh, seeks to raise up is now being seen as a global challenge and one that I think has had a positive impact around the world. So in both of those instances, I take a degree of optimism uh, for where it might lead ultimately. I, I think that's right. I, and I actually, I'd, I'd also say, one of my colleagues pointed out, and, and I think there's some truth to this, um, the a kind of parallel to to the what the importance in the 60s was of engaging the moderate clergy which is that there's a segment of the that you're seeing showing solidarity that doesn't have the ardor of the activists but they're but they're they they're expressing solidarity in an obligatory way and it's easy to say well you know they're just doing it because it's obligatory but i think you've got to set those norms and those convent that's what that to me is a part of what makes the emerging generations sort of see the shift that they need to be uh, a yes. part of. And so I actually, I take optimism in that. That alone doesn't drive a movement, but I think it's a part of the fuel uh, no, I of, think of a right. movement. I think you're very right about that. You know, uh, this is a unique moment, Sam, in another way as well. And that is this concept of truth is being put on the table as something that we as a nation must be willing to engage if we're ever going to succeed in bringing about the change that we hope uh, to see as Americans. I mean, I, I understand we're, you know, working toward a, a more perfect union. I got that. And I think that symbolizes it. But look, if we ever want to make this a country that uh, really actually reflects its ideals, a country as good as its ideals, then we're going to have to confront the very painful truth of racial injustice in this country, of, of systemic racism, and we have to. Now, there were moments in time where I think the country was, was on the verge of doing that, but faced setbacks that made it almost impossible. You know, in, in 1967, uh, Sam, Lyndon Johnson, uh, one of, in my view, the nation's greatest presidents, uh, uh, established a commission known as the Kerner Commission, mm -hmm. named after uh, the governor of Illinois at the time, Otto Kerner, to study the causes of riots uh, that had occurred in the country uh, in around 1967, but even uh, before that. But I think in Detroit, the riot in Detroit saw 43 uh, people killed. In Newark, New Jersey, that same year, 27 uh, people were killed, and there had been riots around the country to lesser or greater degree in terms of, of impact. And I think there was a real sense that the country was potentially coming apart. That commission uh, did something that was really quite incredible. And it identified systemic racism, structural discrimination as a key barrier for addressing opportunity in American life. It was too shocking for the body politic to absorb. President Johnson, uh, had commissioned, had established the commission, but was reluctant to pursue its findings. And it was a missed opportunity, a missed opportunity. There is an effort underway now by uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee to set up something known as a Commission on Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation, HCON Res 100. It's gaining a momentum. It's got close to 150 co-sponsors in the House. Uh, but the point is, it's a commission that is intended to address, uh, obviously, these issues of racial conflict and long since the causes that have helped to produce today. And when you add to that, the fact that there is also a bill known as uh, HRES 40, uh, H, um, yes, HR 40, it's uh, set up, uh, sponsored by uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, Congresswoman from Houston, and it's a, a commission to establish, a, it's a bill to establish a commission on reparations, the process of reparations in this country. Now, both reparations and this construct of truth and racial healing are, are alien to some, and some may see them as fringe movements, but they go to the heart of what this country must ultimately confront if it is willing to make progress from where we are now to where we'd like to be. Why, why is it so hard? Why do you think this issue is such a tough one? Why do you think we have such a hard time um, embracing the truth that this is historic and embracing the truth that to be systemic means it implicates all of us? Yes. I, I think 
Sam, that um, sort of making a fundamental um, assessment of who we are as a people and the nature of our development is very painful. And when you think about the founding of our nation, there are two, not one, there are two fundamental sins of American democracy. One is, is enslavement, we, slavery, we've talked about that, and there are many reasons for it. The other is genocide, uh, the impact on indigenous populations and the history of our engagement with the Native American population here. It's very shameful. Uh, people have had real difficulty in confronting in an honest way uh, how we came to be. And I think that the cumulative effect of looking at, you know, uh, what uh, slavery hath brought, you know, just you know, Brian Stevenson has set up a, an incredible museum in Montgomery, Alabama, focused on lynchings mm -hmm. and has documented well over 5,000 lynchings, extrajudicial murders, people being hanged, primarily African-Americans uh, being hanged by local citizenry for sport and based on you know, lies uh, and mischaracterizations of uh, racial attack. I mean, all of that is hard to deal with. So I, I would say that kind of honesty, that kind of honesty is hard to accomplish. And unless individuals are confronted with the evidence that uh, they can't refute, uh, they're not going to be willing to accept voluntarily a characterization of themselves that is so fundamentally inconsistent with the ideal that they have constructed to define who they are. I mean, the contradiction between who they really are and what they say uh, they represent is very difficult for many people. So uh, I do think uh, one needs uh, to be a bit of a psychiatrist to analyze that completely. But I think that's a big part of it, Sam. But that's why this moment in time is so important. That's why the George Floyd murder, which in years past would have been easily dismissed in the absence of video. I mean, without the video, this would have been another accusation of a police citizen confrontation in which a black person, a black man was killed by the police officers. And while there would have been some local uh, anger, it would not have necessarily emerged as it has uh, become the global phenomenon. Video in this instance made a difference. And it was the fact that you couldn't look away. You yeah. couldn't yeah. turn away from it. So there I it is. I think, you know, I wonder too, and then now I have to, I'm adopting sort of your more optimistic frame, you know, that part of the, part of the horror of the George Floyd video, I think also gave some people who I think do struggle with not wanting to feel guilty for the system they're a part of, the, the impassivity of the officer. I think a lot of people looked at that and said, I'm not that. You know, whatever I am, I, yes. I am not that. And if I'm not that, then what am I going to do yes. to prevent that from happening? And I, I, you know, again, all you can hope is that opportunity comes out of tragedy. And so I do, you know, I do, I do hope that that moments like this, these vivid moments give people a, a pathway to, to become more, you know, neither of us are psychiatrists. You were going right. to be a sociologist, right. but neither right. of us are psychiatrists. Right. Right. Some way... I would hope that it gives people, because I think you're right, shame was the key word in yes. what I heard you describe. There's a feeling of shame that overwhelms even people's sense of what's, what's just. And, and, you, and shame is a visceral emotion. You have to give people some other competing visceral emotion that I think that they can attach themselves to. Yeah, that's right. I also think, though, um, there is a fundamental element in the national character. Now, I'm, I'm you know, stepping out on the limb here, and I suspect there will be many who disagree. But I think when the American people are confronted with evidence of injustice that can't be denied, coupled with a level of activism that pushes for social change in the purest fashion, people who are willing to risk everything to promote a concept and to promote change. Uh, in that sense, um, the American people respond. Now, I think about what has happened. Now, obviously, you know, it took a civil war <laughs> to, to end uh, slavery. 
Uh, but and, and clearly, we have been struggling uh, uh, since that time to really, uh, you know, another 150 years to advance meaningful social change. But ultimately, ultimately, the American people have been willing to confront some of these issues in spite of the shame and the, the difficulty that flows from that. And I think it's part of our national character based on the belief that these constitutional principles that we salute so frequently really do have meaning and that people believe in uh, what uh, they say uh, as it relates to this country. It, it is the one instance where American exceptionalism, in my view, has some validity. I, I do think there is a belief that our Constitution has a, a meaning that should govern how we respond to uh, these profound social injustices. And I hope this meet, this moment will help to bring that about. I agree. I, I, that's, I, I, to me, I, um, it ha there are risks, there are vulnerabilities, but to yeah. me, that almost kind of religious devotion to that, I, that version of exceptionalism, I think yes. powers us. At some point, it's an article of faith that you think yes, this is, is the better way to do it than some, especially in the face of examples of autocratic examples that still have some version of prosperity. So, I mean, I, I think that is, that is not to be surrendered, surrendered lightly, even as we critique it. But let's go, let's go back to the life for a minute. So you've, 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 you've given up sociology in favor of the law, a decision <laughs> parents praise to this day. Um, so what, 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 came, what came next for you? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I had an opportunity, uh, uh, Sam, when I was in law school to, um, when I graduated, to uh, direct the uh, minority student program at Rutgers. Uh, before that, I had spent some summers working in Mississippi um, as a lawyer with legal services. And uh, those experiences of being a lawyer with legal services and, and also working at Rutgers really sort of helped to shape me toward a commitment of um, engagement. Uh, the first job that I had, though, which directed me toward my career uh, and what I'm, I, I'm retired from and what I'm, I'm still doing today, I was with the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, I was with the ACLU Washington office at the time uh, that uh, President Reagan I came into power and I decided um, leaving a, a job in Washington, I was head of a group called the Council on Legal Education Opportunity, which was an affirmative uh, admissions program for law schools. Uh, I decided when President Reagan uh, came into power that I wanted to do something else. I wanted to have a real impact on policy. I took a job with the ACLU and I worked there for 10 years. And the ACLU Washington operation taught me so much I learned my skill as an advocate on Capitol Hill. I learned how to uh, really help promote uh, legislation, particularly that had social justice impact. And I got to see a variety of issues that, um, you know, not only involved uh, the advancement of civil rights, like the Fair Housing Amendments in, in 1988, but I got to work uh, on a bill known as the Japanese American Redress Bill. Also, the civil, it was known as the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. It really helped to establish the right of Japanese Americans in turn during World War II uh, to reparations, to compensation for their losses. And I learned a great deal from that experience. And I got to work on uh, other legislation that uh, made a huge difference. Afterwards, I went to the NAACP. And uh, I headed the NAACP's Washington uh, office. I was the NAACP's lawyer and lobbyist in Washington. It was a great honor for me uh, because I was uh, in the tradition of two people who had preceded me. One, a gentleman by the name of Clarence Mitchell, who history will show as the 101st senator because he was such an incredible voice uh, for the civil rights movement and is credited with having helped to advance many of the civil rights acts, the major acts of the early 1960s, the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, etc. And his deputy, Althea T.L. Simmons, a great woman advocate, learned a great deal from her. And, um, you know, I followed in that tradition. Mm -hmm. And it was at the NAACP that I helped uh, deal with two issues that, uh, for me, stand out. Uh, one was the confirmation battle over Clarence Thomas's confirmation to the Supreme Court. Uh, and fortunately, uh, we were able to steer the NAACP's opposition 
uh, to Clarence Thomas's confirmation in a way that I think uh, made a huge difference for the organization and for the community that we represented. Uh, African Americans were confronting, uh, really for the first time in the modern civil rights movement, one of the uh, contradictions of whether someone who was an African American would by definition be supportive of the advancement of African American interests, or should we ignore that um, um, a concept and simply support him because he is an African American. And you may recall that when President George H.W. Bush appointed, uh, uh, who was then Judge Clarence Thomas to the court, he was filling to fill a seat vacated by the legendary Thurgood Marshall. And um, we believed that you needed to evaluate this jurist based on his performance, not based on his race or who you thought he should be or would be uh, when he was appointed to the court. And that was an internal uh, debate about that, but we prevailed and we got the facts of his record established as the basis for our evaluation. And I'm honored and pleased that we were able to get the NAACP and much of the African-American community to oppose him. But I was also there uh, during the passage of the Voting Rights Act reauthorization uh, and, uh, you know, I did uh, that and, and I left the leadership, uh, the NAACP at the time I was at the leadership conference, but I got to work on um, the Voting Rights Act. And that for me was one of the great uh, victories of, of my professional life. So I really enjoyed that. So I want to, let's talk a little bit more about the Clarence Thomas confirmation, because yeah. there's kind of a couple features um, of that that moment that presaged some of what we experience today. I think one is, if, if it wasn't the first, it was certainly one of the early turning points in the circus-like um, coverage that can happen uh, uh, around certain political events where a lot of meaning is attached to whether this person, I mean, I guess Robert Bork probably on the judicial side was the it first was the one, first. but certain, Claire, there was, because of the Anita Hill controversy, there was just yep. so much around it. I mean, Joe Biden, it was a big moment for him. Um, and then also this, um, you know, certainly on, frankly, on the left and the right, this, the, the inability to escape the sort of internecine forces around the kind of nuance that you had to navigate, where the sort of division um, kind of within the movement about what this meant is something now that is really perilous. I mean, you know, one of the, probably one of the big stories that's going to be written about the, we were talking about this before the show, the Democratic Convention is one of unity. That was not a foregone Conclusion, um, given given um, the the way the progressive base of the party um, has expressed itself recently, so so how to tell us just more about kind of like how yeah. you managed to navigate that as yeah, a leader? Yeah, actually, it was incredibly painful, um, Sam, um, and it was a very difficult period uh, for me professionally. Look, this this happened about thirty years ago. Uh, Clarence Thomas was nominated uh, on the July Fourth weekend. And um, there was a certain cynicism to it that, um, you know, we have to simply establish as a point of fact, yeah. regardless of one's views about George H.W. Bush. Now, you know, this is a guy who gave us the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, yeah. and he deserves a lot of credit for that. But he also um, made one of the most cynical appointments to the Supreme Court that's ever been documented, and that was Clarence Thomas there had been a real uh, craving uh, on the part of the civil rights movement, uh, the African-American community most especially, to have a replacement akin to Thurgood Marshall uh, take his seat on the Supreme Court. Uh, we all knew how important it was uh, to have a, an African-American experience, life experience reflected among the jurists and the absence of, of someone like a Thurgood Marshall meant uh, a tremendous amount in turn, it was a great loss uh, for how the Supreme Court's deliberations occurred. Uh, when, um, you know, President Bush announced the appointment of Clarence Thomas, uh, it was met with um, an incredible reaction on the part of many in the African-American community. You know, for some, it was instant opposition uh, based on uh, Thomas's positions at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission where he had been and also on the uh, Court of Appeals. It was not as if we didn't have a record to review. In this instance, there was a pretty extensive record that allowed us to really look at his uh, role, both as an administrator in the federal government and also 
as a jurist to help evaluate him. And yet there were also many who believed he was an African-American and for that reason, you needed to embrace him. And of course, Thomas himself helped to create that aura of, by arguing that, look, you know, there is no monolithic point of view uh, in the African-American community and arguing that everyone has to think like Justice Marshall is too narrow a perspective uh, to apply to a jurist. The point, however, is that his application of constitutional principles was so restricted and so incredibly harmful to advancing the broader goal of equality for all that one could easily justify uh, not supporting his candidacy again based on the record that was produced. Uh, as uh, head of the, uh, the NAACP's Washington office, I had the responsibility of helping to uh, correct um, and establish our point of view. Uh, but truthfully, um, Sam, there were real problems uh, because uh, there were some in the leadership of the organization who took that view that uh, you know Thomas would be terrific once he got on the court. Once you gave him lifetime tenure, what you see as his sort of brusque side, which has appeal uh, to some of his Republican sponsors, would evaporate and he'd become Thurgood Marshall number two on the Supreme Court. Uh, that was always a view that I found uh, completely implausible. And I think the record that had been created leading up to that point uh, made that impossible to accept. Uh, and so there were great divisions. Our opposition was based entirely on that record at the time. Now, the Anita Hill controversy added to um, you know, the difficulty that uh, uh, we faced in opposition uh, to Thomas's confirmation. And I remember uh, the challenge that uh, was posed by that time. And I think, you know, in looking back at that uh, experience, I understand in part the processes that helped to produce that outcome. You may recall that after the Thomas, um, the Judiciary Committee hearings with Anita Hill, in the next Congress, there was an effort to bring women to the Judiciary Committee for the first time. Senator Feinstein and um, uh, set, uh, the senator from uh, uh, Illinois, um, first African-American female uh, to the United States, Carol Mosley Braun, yeah. uh, was appointed to the Senate Judiciary Committee. And, and, you know, those changes occurred because of the reaction to the Thomas confirmation. I think what is most important now, and, and this is something that uh, I'm, I'm actually writing on, uh, in the 30 years that Justice Thomas has been on the bench, it's important to evaluate his body of jurisprudence and compare that to what was said about him before his confirmation mm -hmm. to see if there is an alignment because there are lessons to be learned uh, from the way in which that confirmation was handled and the experience within the African-American community. And hopefully uh, by uh, writing that about it and talking about where we are, it'll help to change the perspectives. I Sort of along those lines, I, you know, another big transformation that you participated in that you witnessed um, during your time at the ACLU, the NAACP, and then the leadership conference has really been the decline in people's perceptions of Congress as a body that can help to advance um, the country as a policymaking body. And frankly, has also been a period of decline of Congress's own investment in itself as a policymaking body. You know, it's been a period marked by delegation of a lot of authority to the executive by the attenuation of congressional staff. I, what, I'd love to know your reflections on the evolution of Congress and whether you perceived some of those changes as they were happening, whether they had an impact on the work that you were, that you were doing. Um, with, 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 with Congress. Yeah, yeah. You know, Sam, um, unfortunately, first of all, you're absolutely correct about public perceptions of Congress. They have diminished over the last 30 years. Uh, and yet um, that criticism is in part uh, based on the emergence of a partisan division, uh, which has made it more difficult uh, to accomplish uh, proactive uh, efforts for reform. It's just almost impossible to do it. And, and part of the reason has been, and, and look, I just have, this is gonna sound partisan, but I'm trying to be as open in my assessment as I can be. I, I do think uh, 
a decision, for example, by Senator McConnell, who is a self-characterized, um, you know, uh, uh, master of, of death, you know, of, of, of legislation <laughs> coming over from the House. He's, you know, the grim reaper, I'm sorry, yeah. that he can't move uh, bills. Uh, for me, is an example of a failure to engage beyond the partisan divide. So uh, when Nancy Pelosi et al. Uh, prepared the HEROES Act, a bill that would have continued the $600 uh, unemployment payments, would have offered aid to cities and uh, states that are Im impacted by COVID and uh, offered assistance to the US Postal Service. Regardless of how you uh, ultimately decided where to draw the line, to make the argument that nothing in that uh, proposal warranted discussion, in my view, is a kind of blind commitment to partisan outcome uh, against the interests that the American people uh, share in common. You know, there was a, a study undertaken by, um, uh, rather reported on the New York Times a couple of days ago, by economists at City University in New York, who looked at the impact of COVID uh, revenue losses in states and cities across the country. The largest 150 cities, both influenced or rather led by Democrats and Republicans, depending upon uh, the state, uh, had impact that was uh, the, you know, equal in terms of uh, the effect on local people. Uh, to ignore that uh, in favor of a partisan solution seems to me to be um, a part of the larger problem that you've talked about. And so, yes, I think we can point to individual periods where um, a, a commitment, you know, to partisanship over uh, policy uh, comes into effect in ways that are very disheartening. I'll give you one example. One of the issues that I worked on uh, before I left the leadership conference was an international human rights agreement known as the Convention uh, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, it is a treaty that uh, was based on, based on the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was the UN's effort to take the ADA uh, formula and apply it globally. And you have over 100 nations uh, that are now signatories uh, to that effort. Uh, the US is not one of the countries that has ratified uh, this treaty. And yet there are clear, ample examples of why this human rights treaty is so important. We have uh, men and women with physical disabilities who are unable uh, to travel abroad because other countries don't have the same sophisticated response to curb ramps and uh, you know, hotels with adequate uh, a place for wheelchairs. That is such a simple uh, commitment of uh, American um, uh, policy uh, largesse to the rest of the world. And yet we have not embraced it. And we haven't embraced it in part because of a partisan aversion to working with the UN. And so when this uh, issue uh, really came up for treatment, we had you know, people who um, spoke out against it, not because of the merits of the treaty, but because they didn't want to engage and work with the United Nations. Uh, that kind of, of hostility toward collaboration with the rest of the world, that kind of hostility toward legislative uh, activity has made a huge difference, which is why, for example, we have not, um, Congress has not enacted the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act, which responded to the Supreme Court's decision of, of 2013, you know, five, seven years ago, uh, that really gutted the Voting Rights Act and made many of the voter suppression problems that we're battling today possible because the Voting Rights Act had been uh, severely hampered. Uh, that kind of, of mindless hostility has got to be uh, challenged. And I think in part, that's why there is such energy around this upcoming election. You see what do you, reason. we're getting sort of close to time and I, I actually, I wanna go a little deeper on this in particular, um, kind of the other, the other, one of the other forces we're seeing that's playing into this. So I, th like, I think I, you know, I, the school that I come from, and just as a point of disclosure, it's a school partly taught by Wade Henderson about these things is, you know, Congress is built for, Yuval Levin, the conservative commentator, and I talked about this last week too, Congress is tailor-made for, you know, in the case of COVID, you say three trillion, we say one trillion, let's negotiate. You, the treaty says every establishment 
you say you want to exempt some businesses, let's do businesses over 50 employees. It's not perfect, but history marches on. That's the arc of justice. That's right. And so certainly I, there has absolutely been this kind of partisan cynicism on the parliamentary side, you know, that it's more in our interests not to negotiate than to negotiate. But there's also, particularly in progressive social movements today in this country, another kind of emerging critique that I'd love to get your take on, which is the, the sort of the revolution over incrementalism. You yeah. know, so yeah. where a defund is a good example of this. Def, defund the police could be seen as a way to shift thinking about what we invest in uh, in order to help communities thrive. But it's also been interpreted by some as we need to abandon having a police force or we're not coming to the table. And how do you, how have you thought about this, the, the, the kind of critique from the left of what a well-functioning parliamentary system yeah, can do, that yeah, it's too incremental? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the issue of incrementalism, as you've described it, is very much on the table today. Now, let me say I believe in two things. Uh, one, I believe in the power of coalition. I, I think that it is almost impossible to really uh, achieve the kind of broad social change that we seek unless there is a coalition of interests in place on almost every major issue. I think that's right. And I think that there has to be uh, some willingness to uh, collaborate to, and, and you know, I know this is heresy on a lot of people's part, to make the argument that you have to be able to sort of reach across the aisle and, you know, form uh, alliances. Look, the, the truth is you need, uh, obviously, in most instances, 50 plus one uh, in terms of votes to be able to achieve uh, uh, effort. But without consensus, without consensus, you're opening yourself up ultimately to an erosion of the very gains that you have made because they are ephemeral. They're based on political power at the time mm. and not based on bringing people along with you and establishing a consensus necessary for change. So it's worth investing some effort to be able to facilitate that. Uh, and I think that's a part of a successful uh, legislative uh, collaboration. And I also think, um, you know, that we have different roles to play. Uh, I'm not uh, upset uh, by those who push uh, for a more immediate uh, level of change. In fact, I think they are necessary because without that uh, sense of, of a dismissive view of incrementalism, without the pressure for more immediate change, the ability to s achieve any result that's positive is, is definitely limited. So I, I think you need uh, interests, uh, as we have uh, progressive interests here, that sometimes push for change because it is the right thing to do. And even though there is a, 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 an unwillingness to uh, make the uh, entire, to swallow the entire proposal, it moves the uh, process forward. You know, universal coverage is a clear example. It's not that <laughs> universal coverage is not right. It's the goal. We all want universal coverage, guys. The question is, how do you achieve it? Yeah. And how can you make it a lasting part of the broader federal process? Now, COVID has certainly exposed the importance and need for that. And I think it has given new energy to those who would seek to bring about uh, that kind of change. But I think it's because of people who have insisted uh, that universal coverage be the standard under debate that that is actually happening. So in my view, there are different roles that uh, we play in this process, uh, but I think all of it is necessary to bring about the change we seek. Well, since the theme of the conversation has been one appropriately of hope, um, we should end on a hopeful note. So what, um, looking back at the career, you know, you've been a part of, you, yeah. know, you know, every every bill I could name um, is there is there one that stands out? Uh, is there some achievement that stands out as something that, that really, um, that you look back on as the most significant thing you were a part of? I, I, look, I think the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 2006, that was ultimately signed uh, by George W. Bush uh, with the uh, almost universal support of uh, you know, Republicans as well as Democrats uh, was, in my view, uh, a highlight. It was brought about by an incredible collective effort of progressive lawyers from various organizations that worked collaboratively in coalition to help develop a bill uh, 
You had members of Congress in the leadership, particularly uh, in the House and Senate, that helped to embrace this concept and to make it work. And uh, we had grassroots pressure from a variety of different sources that all worked collaboratively to produce the change. So this bill that normally would have taken about two and a half to three years uh, to move through Congress happened in record time because of this uh, collaboration and this willingness to move. It was a highlight uh, of my legislative career. Uh, I add to that a uh, bill like the uh, Japanese American Redress Bill because um, it is recognition that the concept of reparations has real validity and appreciation in Congress. It's the most recent example of that in my view. And it applies to the circumstances of, uh, of slavery and the need to confront uh, the truth about that. So uh, those bills have had a huge impact. But I think, you know, it, it's hard to choose among your favorites because, you, you know, you've got bills that have brought about such a huge level of change. The Americans with Disabilities Act, that is the, it, it's the equivalent of Brown versus the board. Yeah for people with disabilities, so we could go on. But I, I look, I, I think that what gives me hope and optimism, and we started a little bit on this end, is I think there are people at the table today who are leading this broad um, civil and human rights movement that we've talked about, that recognizes the crises that have been produced by the COVID pandemic, the emergence of this incredible uh, a problem of structural racism, uh, trying to rebuild the economy, which is in tatters, and, and looking at the risks to our own national security posed by the attacks on our election system and, um, and how uh, Russia, uh, perhaps China, are trying to interfere with our elections. Those crises, when taken together, are perhaps the most serious set of problems uh, we as a nation have ever confronted. The question now becomes, how will we respond to that? And whether we will see this, not just as a challenge, but also as an opportunity for change. And I think you are seeing the emergence of new ideas to respond to some of these challenges in a way that actually will help us become a stronger nation, uh, a nation that is really capable of influencing policy around the world. The you know, climate change, for example and our ability to respond to that is part of the challenge that this uh, global pandemic has helped to uh, under underscore. Uh, so uh, I think it's really important. And this is a good time. I think a challenge, but an important time. All right, everyone, we will, uh, we will uh, just want to let you know about a couple upcoming shows. Uh, next week, We'll have uh, Eli Lair, the president of R Street, and the week after that, Olivier Sylvain, a key scholar studying the future of speech on the internet. Uh, as a reminder, this episode will be up on the website later. You can see this episode and any episode on demand at kf.org slash fdshow. You can subscribe to the podcast anywhere you can get your podcasts. Uh, email us at fdshow at kf.org, or if you have questions, just send them to me on Twitter at the Sam Gill. Please stay for, two, for 30 seconds to take a two-question survey. And as always, we will end the show to the sounds of Miami songwriter Nick County. Check out his music on Spotify. Until next week, thanks, everyone, and stay safe.